Hello, I'm happy to welcome back the film's co-writer to be as Lindholm and director and co-writer Thomas Vinterberg uh, to do a Q&A session. Firstly, um, congratulations on another round. Uh, you have worked together on several films, as you mentioned in your interview, in your introduction, um, and you've worked with many of your cast and crew before. So I presume that there's a level of familiarity and trust on your set. And I wondered what impact that had on your creativity. Well, being with your friends, Tobias is one of my friends, Matt is one of my friends, being in this uh, sense of Danish creative community uh, gives, uh, gives me courage. At least me, it gives courage. I hope it does the same for the others. We um, were able to move a bit further uh, and a bit more courageous when we move together. Uh, also, it's interesting to challenge your actors if you know them really well, if you admire them, and if you're still curious about these human beings. Um, there, there's there's a sense of collaboration which extends all the way into deep into the character, I guess. Writing the screenplay, knowing who we are writing to, which actors is key. So when we started to write, and we knew that we were writing for these four uh, actors, helped us a lot. We knew, we know what they can do. Thomas knows where he needs to feel he needs to challenge. And in, in, in many ways, that's extremely helpful and then, of course, to, to share lives as we do uh, and, and, and to, uh, to create a, a film together always demands honesty and it's easier among friends. So in many ways, the process was, was kind of easy. That doesn't mean that it's easy to make a movie like this, but at least you can get rid of your fear. You are uh, among, among friends, so you can let go and just give it your best. Um, and in my case, I mean, I came out of the Danish film school uh, 10, 12 years ago, and the first Danish director who called me was Thomas asking me and inviting me to, 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 to co-write Submarino with him. And uh, I was lucky then, and I'm lucky now that I'm still part of, of, of these movies and of this group of, of people here in, in Denmark that are still together and still uh, making movies together. I was looking back at an interview that you gave, Thomas, in 2016, where you mentioned that you'd been working on an alcohol project with Tobias for quite some time, even then. And I wondered if this film had an unusually long gestation period, and if so, what were the challenges of this particular project to bring it to screen? Well, Tobias and I and another colleague of ours met over months and years trying to crack this, drinking Coca-Cola Zero and going back to our uh, sort of rational lives. But at some point we ran into this theory from the Norwegian philosopher, thinker, psychiatrist, who claims that that human being is born with a little bit of alcohol too little in the blood. I don't know how to translate that, that into English. He claimed that you should be born with small doses of alcohol in the blood because it increases uh, creativity and it cre increases courage and, and stuff like that. I guess the theory that, that you've made in the movie, you've just seen. And, and that sparked things forward for us. Also the idea of putting this into a school helped us tremendously and dramatically and also having time in our calendars from other projects um, made it possible to make this movie. Uh, but it's normal for us to have an idea boiling for some time, for years, and then at some point, if it's strong enough, this idea, it will materialize itself into a movie. And I guess that mentioning already in, already back in, in 2013, you know, forced us to make this. Thomas had promised the world a movie that celebrated alcohol and, 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 and I think the world wanted that story. So we were kind of, it was, you know, we were obligated to, to, to find the time and sit down and do this. And then reading this theory resonated 
uh, right away. I remember days in my small cabin in the forest with my three children, realizing that I'm a much better father after the first glass of wine around <laughs> five o'clock. And during the summer, that uh, five o'clock becomes four o'clock, quite easy. And after a couple of weeks, it becomes three o'clock. And if there's just a truth to it, it's not the answer to life, but there's a truth to how domesticated, how civilized we are. And maybe all that controlness uh, and all the control we take of things, maybe it was a reminder that, that it's positive to let loose and just become a playful person once in a while again. And maybe that's why we use alcohol. At least that was the theory. And I just felt the truth in that right away. And I thought, well, let's make an honest story about that. And we talked about that. How can we, how can we undress and just honestly admit how our lives are and how we need to, uh, to defrost ourselves from this rigid control. Just to go back to um, something that I think Tobias mentioned, um, you said that when you're writing, you often write with particular actors in mind. Um, and I wonder if you, once you know who your ideal actor is, whether or not you completely write the part for that actor, or whether there's a kind of general character that you create. So for example, in another round, was Mads Mikkelsen always going to be your Martin, your main character? It was such a long time, but as I remember it, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, we hoped that Mads would play the part. So we wrote it for him. We took a chance and we wrote it for him. And then as soon as he got involved, it was easier because then we could speak to him about. He is also a person who can identify with the lives we are portraying. And therefore his knowledge was extremely important for us. And he can dance. And then he can dance. <laughs> and then and, and that's, uh, that's a certain quality. Um, no, but they've yeah. seen the movie, so we spoil it. That's correct. He can dance, and, and Thomas had a big fascination with, 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 with Mass dancing, and we all know that Mass is a ex great actor. So we are always aiming for the stars, and yes, of course, we would write this part for, for Mass and, and nobody else. And was the dancing always an element of that character? Because it's, it's, it's trailed from quite early on in the film that, you know, he, used, he has the moves, he, he used to be a dancer. Was that always part of your character of Martin that you developed? It took some convincing, uh, you know, particularly of Mads, uh, because he was, he was obviously nervous about this. It's been many years that he hasn't been dancing. Because he initially trained as a dancer, didn't he? he, he he's been a professional dancer. And every move in the movie is done by himself. Mm. There's, no, uh, there's no dance doubles or anything. Uh, and uh, he felt 25 again, but only for a couple of hours. The next day he <laughs> felt 65. <laughs> but but uh, uh, he, um, it, we, always, we always knew that we wanted this sense of a catharsis. We wanted him to fly. We wanted someone to die and someone to fly. Because we don't want to give the answer. We don't want to be moralistic. We don't want to be uh, crazily celebrative. We want to investigate this alcohol thing. And therefore, we always wanted two solutions. We, we wanted to give a feeling that this can get, create a renewal of a life, uh, a revelation of the source. Mm -hmm but also that this can be fatal. So he had to end in some kind of ecstasy. I think that I was from the beginning early on against the idea of the dance. I couldn't see how we could make that work. I thought that it was, I kitsch. just did kitsch and I didn't really get it. I got the idea that we needed to end him on top of things, reborn, ecstatic, celebrating, but it was definitely Thomas's vision uh, that to use Mass's talent and training as a dancer to, to do this. And, and 
I was uh, I was not uh, into the idea in the beginning, but as we have done in all the movies we've done, slightly I get convinced by Thomas's uh, ideas when they are good enough. And in this case, it was it was it was it was uh, it was definitely now that I saw it after the editing, it's a wonderful ending that I wish I could take the credit for. I was very interested in what you said, um, Tobias, that you were only convinced at the editing stage. Were you? unconvinced all the way through that that was the right thing to do? I just didn't know how that would work. I couldn't see it, you know, it was inside Thomas's mind. And at a point I had, I was convinced that he knew what he was talking about. And I could just lean back and wait. And my suspicion was that it would be, you know, that it would die in the editing room. And what I realized seeing the movie was that it was the perfect crown uh, on the movie. It was a perfect way of of, of celebrating and saying goodbye to uh, to, to 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 Martin to Mass's character, um, it felt like because it's also a struggle with life. There, it's not only positive. There is a certain anger in Mass's expression in it. There is also the weight of all the stuff, the loss he has done, uh, he has the, the the sorrow he's felt. So it's a big mixture of an acceptance of where he is in life and then the possibility of a future. And I did not hear that in, or understand that out of the dancing idea, but nevertheless, that was exactly what was served to me in the ending, so I am very pleased. But I think, you know, th this obviously took some convincing of Matt's, he was uh, secure about it, which makes him even braver to then throw himself into it, uh, sort of, um, surrendering to my idea uh, also tells the story about the community that we have. This is a man who says, okay, I trust in you, Thomas. And, I, and then he just jumps into a dance in front of his world audience, uh, which, which I think was very, very, very brave of him. It took the right music. It was really difficult to find the right music. I'm really interested in where you found many of the tracks, but particularly What a Life by Scarlet Pleasure, which is the, the track that uh, Mantis' character Martin dances to at the end. Where did, where did you get that from? Well, to be honest, it was my wife. Ah. I, I was all, all over the world trying to get really, really expensive rides, and she just kept on playing this song for me from one of our, one of our local heroes. Uh, Scarlet Pleasure, and it 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 has the sort of sense of rebelliousness and the party, and yet the seriousness and the sense of being drugged by life, and it's got all these things in it. So I don't know why I couldn't see it to begin with. She was persistent for like more than a year, and uh, and now I've now you know learned to love this song uh, limitlessly. And do you make the choices about music together or is that something that's very much your role, Thomas? In, in this particular movie, we talked about that the music of the movie should be not a score, but the music that they listen to or the songs at school. End of story. No more music than that. No, no sort of defining underscore because we wanted this to be truthful and confrontational of sorts. Uh, then Tobias went off making his own masterpieces and I was left with finding that music. It was really, really hard work and very difficult and it took a long time and I spent a lot of energy because I, I feel it's so important. And it was just searching, trying, searching, trying, uh, talking to different people, um, you know, and, and at the end, you find something that you love. We, we worked early on in, you know, talking about music because music is part of the uh, drinking ritual. I mean, when we, when we party, we drink and we listen to music and we dance around. So it's part of, of getting drunk. Uh, so we would, we would talk about not specific numbers, but more how will uh, music uh, be part of uh, a movie like this? We had all sorts of ideas. We also discussed too, to, to, to have no music at all in, in it. Um, and writing scenes with our main characters with headphones, uh, moving around, drunk, listening to music, watching them 
listening to music, but not presenting the music they were listening to. Um, and, 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 and finally, uh, Thomas came up with the idea of, of one of our guys being, uh, since he was a music teacher, um, we could have music with the choir and the traditional uh, school music, and then there would also be the party music that is uh, uh, that is part of the of the celebration and and the drunkness. So, uh, and and that, that became it. And and I think that the that the, the, the final song I had never heard it before, to be honest. Um, and but when I when I when when Thomas played that for me, I was convinced that it would fit perfectly. It is very, very well found by, uh, by Thomas as well. Um, your cinematography um, is really sensitive and quite expressive in this film. In, and in many of the scenes, the camera seems to sort of gently sway and then at other times almost swaggers with them in a kind of drunken fashion. Um, I found that really effective. And I wondered if that was something that you'd planned to do. Is that something that was in the script or something that developed as you went along? And how far did you feel that you were going to push that? Um, well, this film, this entire movie is handheld. Um, and, but it's handheld by a young, steady guy. So at the point you can't see it. And obviously, well, this, this cinematographer, Stuart Hunt Grovelin, who just shot another beautiful film called Wendy, which will have international release very soon, is extremely sensitive. And he, he picks up the vibration amongst the actors in a way that I find uh, deeply fascinating. He, he's a true artist. So this is uh, a flavor of sorts that we've added to the movie. And of course, we talked, them. we talked about how, what concept to follow, how to follow the alcohol concept and how to follow uh, the situations. And, and, and we wanted to create a, a distorted life with, with noisiness and grayness when they were sober. And then when they started to drink, things became smoother and easier and opened up and crystallized. And uh, so we wanted to go with that experience of, of drinking. And then obviously that's the beginning of the drinking. And then obviously when you get a, above 0 0.8, things get dizzy and emotional in a different way. And uh, so, so we kind of tried to follow the alcohol curve development and there's a I think as well there's a there's a discipline isn't there where you you have to say right we're gonna stop here because then it becomes too expressive and that's all you're looking at oh I would never stop him I would let him go crazy with his camera if, if that's what what is called for uh, he's he's the kind of cameraman who doesn't who doesn't sort of add movements for artificial reasons. He, it, there's a great sensitivity and honesty in, in the way he portrays these characters. So if there's an ugliness in the scene, there will be an ugliness in his way of, of portraying it. Um, and that's how I like it. I'd like to thank your sales agent, Trust Nordic, your production company, Zentropa, and also the Danish Film Institute. But most of all, thank you so much to you, Tobias, and to Thomas for being here to share the film with us and for answering our questions. Thank you very much indeed. We would like to thank the London Film Festival for inviting us again. Thank you so much. And we would like to thank, you know, United Kingdom for understanding how to drink <laughs> and wanting to learn more about <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I look forward to welcoming you both in person um, to a London Film Festival at some point in the future. Thank you both very much. Mm -hmm.